Welcome to the Florida Band Podcast. You know why you're here. My name is Andrew Lopez, band director at Coniston Middle School in West Palm Beach, Florida. This is the first of actually three episodes where we're only going to have a solo host and a guest host. Our first host this time is Dr. Tiffany Cox. She's the band director at Lake Worth High School. She's also like award winner and grant winner extraordinaire. Uh, what's up? <laughs> hey, nice to be here. So we got Tiffany here. The subject for today is her dissertation. What's what's the title? <laughs> the title of my dissertation is The Impact of Gender on the Experiences of Female High School Band Directors in the State of Florida. I'm about it. So we're just going to kind of dive right in. Oh, wait. Um, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Just got done with the first week of band camp. So oh, yeah. extra crispy and a little tired, but extra, we're doing good. Extra burnt. It's an, and it was amazing because like the thunder, it was, we had such a dry July until band camp, until band camp. And then the first, like we like, there was no, there were no lightning strikes in South Florida. And then suddenly it's like, oh yeah, no, we're, yeah, no, Poseidon hates us. It's yeah. fine. You're trying to get stuff done. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> What's visual? Who cares? It's time for music rehearsal. Let's go. So let's dive right in. Um, you know, for Tiffany's, for those who don't know, Tiffany, um, she got her doctorate from FAU, and you got your, and what's your doctorate in? Uh, curriculum and instruction. So it's actually an education degree, but I did it in, um, my research is in instrumental music. Okay. So I was in the College of Education and got my degree through the education, uh-huh. but the reason why I did that was to be able to advocate for music in the education sphere. And... So to get another music degree on top of music degree on top of music degree didn't really make sense for me. I really wanted to be able to branch out and advocate for what we do to everybody else who thinks it might not be as important. It's not a bad way. Well, you got, and then you got your bachelor's and master's from FSU, right? Mm-hmm. And you're not music ed. No, not at all. I have my, <laughs> my <laughs> um, I did music therapy at FSU for a while, and then my grandfather became terminally ill, so I needed to move home quickly. Um, didn't have time to do an internship, so I graduated real fast um, with a BA in jazz from FSU. Cool. So. All right. Well, uh, so we're basically spending the time talking about her dissertation, and um, you know, when she presented it, what was that like two years ago? I've presented a couple of times at NAFME and FMEA and yeah, she's you, like she's been all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time I hear it, I'm just like, man, it's pe- more people really do need to hear this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and it's just it's a conversation that you know I get ch- she challenges me on the conversation all the time, and I really don't mind getting slapped in the face about it um, <laughs> because it's just it's just a good conversation to have. So dive in, you know what what are your, what are your find- findings? All right, so um, I think it's best to start with a little bit of historical context because a lot of people don't know anything about the history of women in instrumental music, specifically in band. Um, So before starting on a history kind of lesson real quick, it's really important to understand that the history that we know very well about women in music is specifically white women of stature in music. You don't say. (laughs) So deeply and unfortunately, um, the women of color who contributed leaps and bounds to our field are largely absent from the story. And that's something that's being revolutionized now and there's a lot of research going on and in the next couple of years we're gonna see some progress in that field. Um, But right now, unfortunately, the history that I'm going to share has a lot to do with white women and rich white women specifically. so even though women in generally ha- in general have been erased from the I guess canon of what we do, mm-hmm. um, it's it's really important to understand that they weren't absent. It's not like men are out there making music and women are like sitting and doing needlepoint all the time. Okay, like music existed in female circles all the time. But I'm gonna give you some like general background information. So in the early 1700s, women were fine in America women were finally permitted to attend schools of sacred singing and to participate in choral music in the church. So restricted to choral music. Choral music, and it had to be sacred. Okay. And then by the 1850s, opera became popular and spread throughout Europe and then came to America, and women were finally able to perform secular music in public, but there were limitations to genre. Mm. So when opera required women to be on stage we were finally able to actually sing in front of people, which was great. Hooray. (laughs) I know. It's the little things, right? Yeah. Um, So it wasn't until the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, when women in America started to gain limited acceptance as instrumental performers, and it was very limited to keyboard instruments like harpsichord, celeste, and piano. That's it? That's literally it. No trombone? No trombone. Absolutely not. There's actually a quote about... Um, I can't remember exactly who said it, but it was like, it's entirely unacceptable for a woman to contort her body around an instrument (laughs) like a cello or a tuba, (laughs) lest lest it cause discomfort for male audience members. But why contort? Yeah, I know, right? Like, 
Well, <laughs> did was posture just always bad back then? I have no idea. What does that mean to contort? I, I think it's. I think contorting means having to spread your legs. I think if. <laughs> I think if, if I if I, I might ask my sixth graders the first time they hold their instruments what contorting around an instrument means. <laughs> it's ridiculous, um, and some of the the history and like the the quotes and the stories about women when we when they first started to get into the symphony scene mm-hmm. are like just so deeply misogynistic and terrible oh God. that like you had to listen you had to be just superwoman to be able to be a person who's like I'm gonna play trumpet for the first time ever in the New York Phil. Like, right. that kind of stuff, I can't imagine being that strong. It's crazy. But so, um, in the late 1800s, um, British-style brass bands became really popular throughout America and also um, kind of led to band being more accepted in public schools. So programs started in public schools all over the United States, and um, girls and women found ways to, to participate in these programs even though they were excluded in school. Okay. So what would happen is like little brothers would bring home instruments from school, you get to p- learn how to play the trombone because your brother already had it in the house. That underground. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's like s- sneaky underground band. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so girls and women found a way to learn the popular instruments of the time um, so they can enjoy music in their homes but they were not allowed to perform in public in orchestras, community bands, school bands, nothing. Right. Um, but it was really common for families to assemble bands of their children. So it became a common practice for people to, like, assemble, like, partridge family stuff. Yeah. Like, get <laughs> that's, a, that's an example. Right? <laughs> get, get all your kids together. Everybody plays something different, so we're going to play for the aunts and uncles at Christmas time kind of wow, thing. Wow, that's... You don't see that any, anymore. No. It, that'd be kind of cool to see, honestly. Mm-hmm. But, okay. I mean, like, I get the evolution of society, and we're not going to get into that. Yeah. But, okay. So, um, as a result of being pushed out of everything, the mm-hmm. girls who grew up playing instruments in their homes decided to make their own ensembles when they grew up. So, in 1873, Helen May Butler formed her own ladies' brass band. And in 1937, the Chicago Women's Concert Band was founded. The Orchestra Classique was established in New York in 1938. And the University of Wisconsin organized its own band. For women. Hell yeah, brass band. That's, <laughs> that's okay. Cool. So, but all this stuff didn't happen until the late 1800s, early 1900s. So this is very recent history. Yeah, post-Civil War. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not even, yeah, the new union. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but then there was also, like, people don't even know this. The female conductor and manager of the Orchestra Classique even established and published a newsletter called Women in Music, which was published between 1935 and 1940. So, Who, like... Do you know who the publisher was? I, I'm going to have to look it up, but... I'm, we can add it in like notes. Yeah, no, that's cool. Cause it's just like, I mean, cause my question is back in the day, you know, things only, things only get promoted that the people who can promote them want to promote them. So the question is if those newsletters came out, like who, who and how could get access to them? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure it would have been, um, women of stature who had access to like any kind of newspaper or like periodical that you could get for like, you know, sure. a penny. Yeah, that's true. You know, inflation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. So in 1925, public schools across the country adopted instrumental music curricula in the form of school band plans that were designed by John Philip Sousa and Austin Harding, who is the band director at University of Illinois. Okay. Um, so they, these school band plans were like curricula that were published by like Con Selmer and stuff like that. Oh. So what would happen is the instrument manufacturing company would sell you all the instruments and the curriculum and provide an instructor for the first however many weeks, 12 weeks, I think, mm-hmm. um, to get your band program set. And then after that, you could hire your own band director and that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, girls were still excluded from participation. That's okay. <laughs> so in the late 1930s, um, at Winthrop College in South Carolina, there was a mu- oh, instrumental music program for women. Um, but only it had only existed because the band director, Mark Biddle, sent out a survey to... Wait, what's his name? Mark Biddle. I thought said Biddle. I was like... <laughs> no, B- B-I-D-D-L-E. <laughs> um, he, he found... He sent out a survey to 1,600 students and found that 260 of the female students which out of 1,600 female students wanted to learn to play an instrument. Sure. It's a huge band. Yeah. It's a huge beginning band. <laughs> so what's the number again? 260 out of 1,600. God damn. So he started the first collegiate women's band. Beginning. Outside outside of a women's like institution. That's a very large hot cross blends. <laughs> that's, all, that's very loud. Okay. That's, yeah. That's great though. So it eventually developed into a concert band, marching program, all that kind of stuff. Right. So the Winthrop <clears throat> College is actually known really well for their female marching band. Even now? 
I mean, no one knows about women-led stuff, so no. Uh, you um, fair. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're working on, is it kind of like sp Absolutely. spread a little spread a little knowledge. Pass the message. Um, so more recently, 1972, the Title IX of the Higher Education Act was passed, and collegiate marching bands were required to admit women. So 1972 is when women were allowed to march in regular marching bands. So 100 years later, after of just those general practices... Then it was like, oh yeah, women, I guess, can also march. Sure, why not? Yeah. Uh, so like, we're we're sitting here like forty years later, going like, oh, this is normal for girls to be a marching band. No, it's not. It's literally not. Yeah. Like this happened in our parents' lifetimes. Right. Um. So then, um, in, on the military side of things, because um, our concert band programs and marching band programs have a lot to do with the military. Mm -hmm. In 1991, Laura Lee Conrad made history by becoming the woman, the first woman to receive a commission as U.S. Navy officer bandmaster. So 1991. You were born. I was born. I was, I was not. I'm a baby. <laughs> um, she also became the first woman to conduct a Navy band overseas. But the irony is that she was conducting the Navy band at the time when women were still not allowed to play in the band. So she was up there in front of a band full of men mm -hmm. and everyone touted that as an achievement. Yeah. Which I like it is objectively, it's, but still like... Eh. It's an incredible achievement. But yeah. at the same time, like looking at our military history why is that imbalance still going on in the 90s yeah that's like, a lot that's a lot of holes and a lot of swiss cheese yeah. <laughs> yeah so um similarly um virginia allen made history in the u.s army band program by becoming the first woman to command and conduct an active duty military band she served as principal conductor of the u.s army forces command band in atlanta and secured her place in the history books by becoming the first woman conductor of the u.s military academy band at west point um, I thought I, I thought I knew that name. It's Ginny Allen, more commonly. Yeah. Um, so Ginny served as the administrator for the Army Bands Program in Washington D.C. and then joined the music faculty at Juilliard. Now, at this point, women aren't women still weren't in the military bands. Um, yes, sir. In, right. During Ginny Allen's career is when it when women start started coming in. Okay. Yeah. And this is give me give me the date again, like the year. Um, this would have been late '90s. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. It's the dates for me. It's it's the dates that like cause the most shock because it's like, wow, that was like, this is, you know, like anything before the internet seems like it was a hundred years ago, but like, that's, that's really not that long ago. Yeah. That's insane. No, it's crazy. And like, it's, it's extra crazy because I'm working on my dissertation mm -hmm. and like working on like nailing down all these dates and stuff like that. And I can just, you know, send a Facebook message to Ginny Allen ha. and like we chat. Well, she, she would be on Facebook cause she's kind of old. That's my link. <laughs> That's kind of, no, Ginny's fantastic, and she actually yeah. she actually put together a Facebook group for women band directors called Women Banding Together, okay. and they do like virtual happy hours and stuff to kind of like support collaboration throughout the entire world. Honestly, what's it called? Women Banding Together. That's neat. Is there like a? Because I know we have there's we have the MDBNA, the Minor, Minority Band Directors Association. Is there also like a women's mm -hmm. official organization? Yeah, I actually presented at their conference last year. Um, it's International Women's Women Band Directors, inter, no Women Band Directors International. Sorry, I, I flipped it backwards. Okay. So WBDI. Okay, that's great. Yeah. No, yeah. and they do they do a conference every year, and normally it's like an actual like in person conference, and mm -hmm. it's totally legit, like FBA summer conference. Yeah. Um, and it's usually in a hotel on a beach. <laughs> um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, can I go? <laughs> I'm pretty sure anybody can go. It's it's all about you know supporting women in music and yeah. and it's kind of spreading like resources that are supportive and like helping allies and things like that. So. All right. It's, it's just establishing cool. that 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 network of women band directors across country. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, all right. So the reason why I chose to do this study is because the history of women obviously is very sparse because it just hasn't been documented as much because it wasn't deemed important and like the, the role of women in history and like that kind of stuff. That's all social roles and like how gender plays into the responsibilities that we have in families and things mm -hmm. like that. And obviously it's evolved over time. Like we're not sitting over here being Joan Crawford in the 1940s. Like <laughs> yeah. we're, <laughs> right. we're doing a little bit better now, but as we can see from, you know, pop culture events, it's not that much better. And the reason why I chose to focus specifically on female high school band directors is because I looked at the, um, a survey that MENC which is like, this is how old the survey is, 2001. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so now NAFME. Yep. Um, but MENC did a survey in 2001 that investigated gender in music teachers. Mm -hmm. So it took orchestra, chorus, band, general music, music theory, like 
everything that you teach um, and kind of reported the numbers on that. So for me, I looked at the numbers and for high school orchestra directors um, in 2001 in the entire United States, 2,203 were men, 1,500 were women. Ooh. That's kind of close though because 42% are women. So we're, we're doing okay there. Okay, fair. In, in chorus, 56% are women. But when we get to high school band, 27% were women. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, obviously the gap is in high school band. And then I was curious, is it band in general or is it just high school? So if you look at elementary school band directors, 46% are women. In mm. middle school, 36% are women. And then in high school, 27% are women. And these are current, how, and you, you do that based off the current numbers of that, of like a couple years ago? This is the 2001 data. It's the most current data that we have. So okay. it'd be really cool for somebody who has way more funding than me sure. um, to, to do this study again. Just thinking about it now, there, there's got to be more. But. I, I would like to assume that there'd be more, but I mean, even just looking at our district, we only have four high school female band directors this in the whole district. Palm Beach County, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, you'd like to think that it'd be better, but it might not be. And I was mainly thinking about the middle school numbers too. Like the middle, middle school, school definitely will be better. It's got, it's got to be way, way mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Absolutely. So for my study, I decided to do two pieces. I did a um, quant quantitative survey that was sent out to the entire FBA membership. Mm -hmm. um, so if you didn't do my study. <laughs> um, <laughs> you dig through your inbox and send it to now. You get like a bunch of responses two years late. For real though, this is my shameless plug. Um, when, when you get an email from someone asking for research participation please do it yeah um because a lot of the times we have no budget we're grad students we're just trying to do some research to better the field and better ourselves and better our students but without participation nothing happens we don't grow right. so if you get an email from someone saying hey can you do this survey for my dissertation or for my thesis or whatever just take 10 minutes and do it I know we're all busy, honestly. I'm a high school band director, I get it, I'm busy. But at the same time, taking 10 minutes to do a survey, no matter what it is. So like for me, a lot of people didn't do my survey because it said women in music. So if you were a man, you were less likely to open up my study and do it. It's true. I got yelled at and then I did it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to like follow up and harass people to, to, to do my email, even though I had Neil send it out. It's true, it's so. true, yeah. I mean, That's like, my shameless plug. What if it's a survey about like, are Juno reads good? Because the answer is no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is the, the bigger study might be perceptions of band directors regarding different brands of equipment. That use Juno reads. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the, don't judge a survey based on the questions because the actual research might be a hidden yeah. concept underneath it. Sure. Just answer the questions to the best of your ability and do it quickly. Like no one's asking you to spend 20 minutes on a survey. Do it fast. Move on. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I sent out my survey to the entire FBA membership, which was 993 people and I got 99 responses. Yikes. Which for, for graduate research, it's really not that big of a deal. Like mm -hmm. it is a small survey. It's a small study anyway. It's just a dissertation. It's not like my life's work or anything. Yeah. Um, so it was okay. So my response rate was about 10%. It's an unfortunate, but it's okay. Um, but in the professional organization, the breakdown of men to women is 72% male and 28% female in FBA. Yeah. So, and that's like anyone who's registered in FBA. Right, of course. So it could be legacy people, it could be retired directors, it could be anybody. Right. Um, so for me, that right there was enough to say, okay, I'm focusing on band. Yeah. Because if we're if we're that lopsided, then we have some problems. Um, and it's and it also like, I'm sure as you figured out why and you only learned it, your eyes only became more and more open. Oh yeah. As, as much as they started, mm -hmm. you know? So I got 99 survey responses. Um, in my responses, we had we ran the gamut from brand new band directors to like 35 year veterans. Um, it was really interesting to look at how the responses varied based on that. Mm -hmm. But more importantly for me, I looked at responses based on gender. So, um, so I asked two main questions in my survey, and the rest of it was demographic data because I was looking at race, class, gender, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but the two main questions were. How does gender impact, or what to what extent does gender impact the instrument selection process of beginning band students? So if I'm in sixth grade and a girl, is my instrument selection process impacted by my gender? And band directors overwhelmingly, if they were male, said no, it does not. So this is kind of the data for mm. the, all you number heads out there. Um, for women, the range of responses was 19 to 100. So out of 0 to 100, women stayed between 19 and 100. For men, they stayed between 0 and 81. 
So there wasn't a single man in my study that wow. that said gender significantly impacted instrument selection. I'm super embarrassed because I was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and then the most common male response to that question was zero. That's wild. So, so men overwhelmingly think that gender has little to no impact on the instrument selection process. But there's actual legitimate research. Well, it's that... ironic because you look, you you just like you present that data, and it's like, well, clearly there is. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. So it's wow. but there's there's research that's been done by male researchers. Yeah. Since the '70s. Yeah. On on instrument preference and gender that has proven like definitively yeah. that that it does impact um so women for the most part rated above 60 um so the the mean for women was like in the 70s and the mean for men was in the 40s sure um so gender impact on professional opportunities for women was the second question so i asked how much does gender impact the opportunities that you're given as a female band director okay so the i feel like that, that you're gonna i get, feel like that one i mean we're about to find out but let me take like a shot, shot in the dark without looking at the notepad I feel like that was probably, hopefully, a little more balanced. She's shaking her head out. No, nope, okay. <laughs> not even a little. Okay. So it was actually worse. Um, you amazing. All right. So Great. so what this was asking is professional opportunities includes getting a job, but it also includes conducting honor bands. It involves um, being an adjudicator for festivals, mm -hmm. like how how you're selected for that kind of stuff. Um, Monica Limer out of, um, I guess she's at Stanford right now. She's in DeLand. Oh, in DeLand right now. Yeah. Um, she did her master's thesis on female adjudicators in FBI. Oh, neat. And it's a fascinating study. If, if you're super bored and really want to read something academic, um, <laughs> look it up. It's a Florida State dissertation or uh, thesis. We might bring her in as like a coupling to this. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, that's um, great. But so that cool. her, her study... <clears throat> investigated how women are getting hired as adjudicators because to hire a female adjudicator for solo ensemble to judge flutes is super super common but yeah. when we look at hiring a female adjudicator to judge visual and marching band right it's probably not happening as much as you think i mean i don't think it would you say based on the caption alone my gender bias leads me to believe no yeah yeah so um and i mean we all have those inherent biases and that's fine and like acknowledging them is part of the battle right but that's part of what i'm doing it's kind of like raising awareness of like hey no these biases do exist let's kind of try to move beyond that's them. the important thing and that's why i really liked about your whole study was that a lot of people would you know could write it off as like oh you think this isn't gonna solve the problem but it's like no no dumb ass we're not trying to solve the problem. <laughs> We're trying to make you ask the questions to solve the problem 30 years from now. Yeah. Like that's It has to start with these baby steps. The way the way that I approached it is how can we make music add better for the girls that are in the program now? Right. And so when they become, when you when you have, gentlemen, when you have that girl who wants to be a music educator and they, they go to they go to UCF or USF to become music ed, what example have you set with for them and, you know, like kind of how they can blaze the trail? I'm And I'll, I'll talk about the findings of the study towards the end, but like... The biggest thing there on that piece is if you are a male band director and you're sending a female student to a college of music or school of music to study music ed, how many female band directors has that child encountered in their education? Right. And the odds are zero. Right. And that's so unfortunate. Like you, you wouldn't believe how many times I go to clinic a school and I have little girls come up to me afterwards and say, I didn't even know that girls could be band directors. Which is wild. And it Which breaks is, your heart. Yeah, that's and it's like thinking and again, like the study that was done in two thousand one. You know, we're twenty years later, and for that to still be happening, is you wouldn't. It's one of those things where you're like you, you don't think about. You wouldn't think that that's a thing. Like that's that sucks. It's a problem. Yeah. Um. I agree. But but on like I mean to extrapolate on that and then we'll jump back. Yeah. Um, is like thinking also about that is how many little girls are Haitian or Guatemalan mm -hmm. or Cuban have never seen a black or brown female band director. That's right. Do you know um, Jennifer Brown? She's the assistant at Okoe. No. You got to talk to her. Mm -hmm. She, you would, you guys would, because a lot of, she, I, she once raised, I once heard her raise that same question. Mm -hmm. That's, and that's, and that's, you're right. Cause you throw, and those are the students you teach. Mm -hmm. You throw another another demographic into the mix and then the yeah. percentage just exponentially gets so much tinier. Yeah, so my goal, like I got the female box checked 
But my goal as a band director is to bring in as many people of color to work with my kids as possible because I am not their population. Like, I am Caucasian through and through. But I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I bring Andrew in to work with my kids. And I have Alondra Balls um, who comes in and, like, putting just a Latina female in front of my kids, yeah. showing that you can do this too. It, it's just representation. That's all it boils down to. Yep. And there's, um, and there's nothing wrong with it for the sake of it. Yeah. That's okay. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm huge on bringing as many people into the room as possible. So, I mean, that's part of it. As we all should be. <laughs> in general. Um, so... Um, basically it boils down to, um, the gender impact on professional opportunities. Women thought gender impacted your opportunities hugely. Of course. As a matter of fact, m the most common female response to that question was 90 out of a hundred. Right. Okay. So if zero is not at all and a hundred is entirely women believed that like, there, it's, it's right there. It's right like, there. Yeah. Like gender entirely impacts your professional opportunities. Show me what the men said. The, the <laughs> men <laughs> 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 the male average was 40. <laughs> yeah. So basically men don't think that gender has anything to do with your professional opportunities, which honestly, I mean, at this point in my research, it's just ignorant. If you're thinking like that, wake up. Sorry. Like, yeah. I, I hate to be blunt, but like, And it's up. another thing we said, we've said it before and we'll say it a thousand times before this episode is over. Like just be, just because you recognize it doesn't mean anything. Like it's other, it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that one more person gets to see it. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's okay. Your coffee's going to taste the same tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> All right, so that, that survey was the first part of my study, and the survey was really used to recruit the interview participants mm -hmm. because what I needed was six female high school band directors that had been teaching for more than five years who have been have a proven track record of being quote-unquote successful, yeah. whatever that means, um, which was used based on, like, MPA scores and, like, reputation in the field and contributions and, like, had you held a, a volunteer, like, leadership position in FBA, like... That kind of stuff. Had you been contributing in your, your district or in the state? Um, so I found six women, which was like way harder than you think because... Um, it, I remember it took you forever. It took forever. Yeah. So I nailed down the first like three really fast, which was nice. But then the other three were like really impossible to find because women band directors are busy taking care high school female high school band directors not mm -hmm. middle school mm -hmm. um busy running marching band they're busy handling all the concert band programs but also have kids of their own right and also are still trying to hold up these you know again joan crawford -y type like gender norms at home mm -hmm. where like honestly like if you just had a baby you're still gonna have to breastfeed so like you're like you're still managing all of these things and even though yes it is it's 2021 women are more busy yeah <laughs> while also running the machine yeah yeah. So, um, so my the main like meat and potatoes of my study was these interviews with these women, um, and the interviews were broken up into three sections where I asked them about their experience as a student in um, their beginning and high school band programs, their middle and high school band programs, sure, their experience as a um, pre-service like collegiate student, and then their experience as a band director in the field, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. like after graduation, really, because it was part of their like I needed to know about the interview process as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. I got all this data, um, coded it, all that kind of stuff. If you're really into that kind of stuff, hit me up. <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. But I'll spare everybody else the... the <laughs> Horrible details. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nitpicky data you're details. You're going to lose me in about five seconds. <laughs> yeah. Um, so nine themes emerged from the coding. Um, so okay. the, the nine themes, briefly, were lack of representation of women in music, um, discriminatory hiring practices, the lack of professional me mentor... Or, sorry... Wow. Lack of mentors that are same sex. Um, the discrimination within the professional organizations. Yeah. Um, l l the ex the mm, availability of leadership experience. Um, Post-secondary experiences. Social roles and their impact on you personally and professionally. Wow. Family and relationship dynamics, which any female band director will tell you is a struggle. Sure. And then women supporting women. And that's crazy because that you so between those six people, this was, and some of those answers were probably unanimous, but obviously there's some variance. But it's still amazing that those are as as each each point, depending on you know your views, may be a certain level of charged, but like they all agree. Yeah, for the most part. Um, so, but it was funny because that that it's like nice segue. That was really good because the I'm good, I'm good like that. <laughs> <laughs> the first big issue that I found in in going through all this data because the interviews with these women lasted between an hour and two hours, um, between an hour and two hours, and so 
I had to write down all of what they said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so transcribe all of the interviews, which took a really long time. But it was really insightful because I was able to see a self-reporting bias. Yeah. Which was like when I said, um, like, hey, had did, did gender have any impact on your music education experiences? And one of the participants said, well... All of my friends that are female played clarinet or flute, and all my guy friends played saxophone, trumpet, or horn, but it didn't impact me at all. And it's like, but you, <laughs> but, but you just, but you just said it, did, cause just, and it's, it's like, just because you noticed it, so clearly it did. Yeah. So subliminally, we're noticing these things, but we're not talking about them. Is the thing. Or there, it's not, or it's not registering. Mm -hmm. Right. But the observation's enough. Yeah, so there, there's this huge disconnect between the idealistic perception of like what band directing is, and like everyone has a fair and equal chance, and everyone can do this, and then the actual <laughs> everyday experience of what we go through. Yeah. So that that was super interesting because that was like, that self-reporting bias was the first issue that I saw. Yeah. Was like somebody saying, okay, well, you know, gender didn't have any impact on me at all, but then. Oh, my husband and I got a divorce because he couldn't handle my schedule. Uh, guys, like when so when <laughs> Tiffany was doing this dissertation, like we'd hang out and she would just internally scream, <laughs> like <laughs> just like randomly at the table because she would tell us what she found. Just, oh! And we're just like, it's it's gonna be okay. Yeah, you just gotta finish. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the main findings were that. Um, there's a couple of different facets that are going to support you as you try to become a female band director. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest one is opportunity. Um, and it, opportunity breaks down into a couple pieces. You need to have at least one positive band director role model. Mm -hmm. And for the women in my study, none of the women had a female role model. Zero. Wow. Okay, including me. And I've never had a female role model. And, you know, these people are the youngest at the youngest millennial and then the oldest, you know, they're... 35 years in the field. Yeah, you know, they're they're the, the late the late boomers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but everybody had at least one positive band director role model that really supported them to go for it, to get conducting experience, that kind of stuff. But not female. Not female. Okay. Never female. Um, and actually, none of the band directors in this study, the female band directors, ever had a female band director ever. Wow. In, in middle high school or college. I had one, but she was an associate, and she was only there for a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had two, and they were both associates, and they replaced each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then the second piece of opportunity is that all of the participants were selected to participate in a state or um, national honor band, or mm. local, state, local state national honor band. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last piece is that they were given the opportunity to serve a leadership role in their school band programs. Okay. Which is a huge, huge, huge piece of and it. And I know some of the people you interviewed thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, that, that, that tracks. Yeah. No, like, if you think about it, if you if you are a girl going through a school band program in middle school, high school, wherever you are, and you are never given the opportunity to flex your, your leadership muscles, you're not going to be able to become a high school band director because all we do is lead. Yeah. That's the whole job. Right. So now it's like looking at it, if you get to flex your leadership muscles and you get to participate in honor bands, get outside of your own band bubble, and you have a band director who's supporting you to do that, right. that's like the perfect storm recipe to result in a successful female high school band director. Okay. Um, so some of the quotes, the, the quotes get, get fun. Oh, um, God. <laughs> well, these ones are, these ones are straightforward. Um, but so talking about role models, my high school band director was the reason why I decided to start tra taking music seriously at all. He believed in me and kept me on track and motivated. Um, he was like a father figure for us. He was just a very positive person. Um, he's one of those people that, you know, his door was just always open. Okay. Or I've been lucky to have some great band directors throughout school and college, but I'll tell you all of them were white and all of them were male. There it is. <laughs> and yeah, that particular one, she's like 46 years old. Wow. So. Well, yeah, I mean, it, based <laughs> off that timeline, that makes a lot more sense, but, mm -hmm. sh but still. Yeah, so opportunity giving girls the chance to um, aud even audition for honor bands is so huge. Because if you think about the girls in your program, you're going to have girls who are really outspoken and really like go get them kind of personalities. But especially like for me, I, te I teach a highly Latina population. So my girls are taught to stay silent in the yep. home. Yep. They're, they're taught to take care of their siblings. They're taught to cook. They're taught to clean. They're taught to like go grocery shopping and do the laundry, but they're not taught to have there's no, individual thought. And there's no emotion. Yeah. They're all, it's like reading the Sphinx. Yeah. 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 But the thing is, is these girls are not shy. No. It's a cultural thing. So yeah. where you're teaching matters. 
Um, and obviously this is going to be different if you're in a totally different cultural background than me. But like, I know for my girls to get them to audition for honor bands, I have to specifically sit them down and force them to do it. Yep. And then once they do it and they get in, they're so proud of themselves and their family's proud of them and they throw parties and stuff. But like getting them to that point is a struggle. Yeah. And it's, it's the kind of thing, cause I, I teach in the same, you know, demographic and it's a lot of thing where sometimes you can... The truth is their parents would love for them to do that, but just the way the culture, the subliminal messages of the culture is don't even ask mm -hmm. because, because we have all of these other things to do. Um, and all, and all you have to do is force them to ask and force them to get that support because it, it, it's there. Yeah. You know, parents are parents. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, um, if you think about it, if, if a band director, cause I mean, we have such a big influence on our kids. And like a lot of the times, especially if you're, if you're teaching in a title one school, your kids are going to see you like a parent. And they're going to come to you for advice and for validation and for everything that they're not really getting at home. And I know that sounds like I'm making a lot of assumptions, but it's my day-to-day -day life. Like, my kids come to me yeah, it's, I mean, it's <laughs> for the everything. It's the Title I experience, uh, I think, above all others. But I, all, all band directors do serve that role to at least one child in their, you know, their career, regardless of where you are and what you teach and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, yeah we can all agree to that to some, to some extent. Yeah. Sure. Um, so for the girls, though... When you go out of your way to tell them, hey, I think you're talented enough to do this, even if they're not going to make it in. You know, for a fact, that I, like, I know my kids are not going to make it into Allstate 10, 9 times out of 10. But saying, hey, I really think that you can do this. Just investing in them a little bit boosts their self-confidence and gives them a total different view on themselves when they look in the mirror. Yeah. And it shows them that they, they have someone in their corner who's going to support them no matter what. Right. And that's so huge. So um, a couple of the quotes from this study... Um, were, I knew that I wanted to be a band director, but I wasn't sure what college I wanted to go to. Then I made it to the Tri-State Honor Band. That experience solidified my mind. I knew where I was going to go, and I knew it was the right place for me. So that's specifically FSU and Tri-State. Uh -huh. um, but like that band director went on to be a phenomenal band director in our area, and she's absolutely killing the game. Right. Um, but without going to that honor band experience, never would have Got gone right. through FSU, mm -hmm. never would have had the experiences that she had. And then this other one um, from a an, an more experienced band director is I loved the all state band and all state orchestra experiences that I was able to do. I got to do both and I learned a lot from, from the different conductors. It was so great to see different styles of teaching. They were fantastic. So it's another piece, getting your kids out of your room yeah. where you're the only person in front of them, putting in front of an all county conductor, an all, all state conductor mm -hmm. and letting them absorb all of that and then bring it back to your program. Yeah. <laughs> it's so big, but don't exclude your girls from that. Of course. Right. Um, so the last piece of opportunity. I say of course, but like that's the study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's logical stuff. Right. But when we're stuck in like the day to day grind of just like running the machine, you might forget about the girls who are just quietly sitting in the back behaving. Or let's do this: quietly sitting in your clarinet section behaving. Yo, don't call me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, like your best behaved kids are sitting in the clarinet section. Talk to them. <laughs> yeah. Make them do stuff that they don't want to do. Push them outside of their comfort zone. That's right. Um, all right, so then leadership is such a huge deal, and I know it was for me as well. Like, I got to be drum major my senior year, um, even after I had some disciplinary issues my junior year. Um, <laughs> that sounds like you. Um, but so my band director was, was super supportive and allowed me to still be drum major, and that really solidified for me that I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I still didn't go into music ed. I wanted to do music therapy because I, I have a family history with learning disabilities and I wanted to work with that. But I knew that I could do it if I wanted to. And that right. was so big. And all of the women in the study agreed with that. Um, so, like, this participant said, getting to be drum major sealed the deal for me. I always loved music, but getting to be in charge of the ensemble was a really empowering experience for me. Sure. And they talked about falling in love with conducting. They talked about... Um, uh, times of hardship where like a band director's dad or mom passed away suddenly and mm -hmm. he had to leave um so the student conductor got to conduct like all the way up until just about mpa wow so like prepare the band for mpa because of this ridiculous hardship that happened yeah um but those opportunities while it might be like sucky for the band director at the time yeah was a life-changing experience for this kid right and now she's like huge in fba and doing yeah. all kinds of stuff yeah. so um Jazz band's a whole other monster that's probably an entire podcast. Um. <laughs> yeah, dude, women in jazz, that's a whole other episode, but yeah, okay, go on. But I'll just do, I'll do a quote from that one. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was intimidated by the quality of the trumpet players in the jazz band. I could tell just from watching them in the practice rooms, I already knew that I wasn't good enough. 
I mean, we trauma players have that effect on most people. Right. So, sorry. <laughs> right. No, but absolutely. But the thing is, is like, it's a girl trumpet player. Yeah. Who's still a trumpet player. Yeah. So like, that's what, that's kind of what I'm saying is like when you have these, especially like freshman girls come in or sixth grade girls, support them yeah. and say like, look, yeah, that might be scary right now, but you can get there. That's right. It's, it's not unattainable. You just have to practice and here's how you practice. And like, here's, here's some videos or here's some resources. And really it's just offering music, offering your music head, but not in in the day-to-day -day grind, not letting it slip for the girls who may need it. Yep. Yeah. Um, this one is about being a band director and teaching jazz. Um, she said, I love jazz and I feel like it's in me and I would love to do it more. I wish I had done it when I was younger. Nobody ever said to me, oh, hey, if you're going to be a band director, you should definitely check it out. So now as a flute player, it wasn't even on my radar. Right. So that's the other thing is the instrument selection and the gendered instrument selection that we go through where we get girls on flute and clarinet Ooh. who never even have the opportunity to play a jazz instrument that's right. feel like they're entirely excluded from the jazz program. Right. Oh, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of other band directors our age that play certain instruments and I'm like, and then, and they have said like knowing them through college and knowing them through the field, they have, I've heard those sentences come out of like, you know, I'm a X player and I just, you know, I can't, I, I don't know that animal. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. 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 No. And like, honestly, from my, from my own experience, when I was at Florida state, I was the only girl in the entire jazz studio. That's wild. Like regardless of instrument, not only trombone. That's, is, that's a big studio, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's nuts. Um, so how about this number? Um, the most recent study in 2017 found that women made up of 60 made up 60 percent or more of the instrumental music education population in co in colleges across the u.s mm -hmm. while they comprised as little as 20 percent of membership in instrumental jazz ensembles yeah so we're the majority in music ed programs but not represented in jazz right and obviously vocal is different than this and orchestra is different but like yes we're looking specifically at band for this we are the florida band podcast <laughs> um so hiring practices are one of the things that have been like exceptionally questionable <laughs> let's uh let's do it we got we got about 15 minutes that's I enough time let's do this i got you on this um so this one's my favorite this is a band director who's near and dear to mine and andrew's hearts um, who she aud she interviewed for the position at my high school that I currently teach at in 1986 or 88. Oh. Um, and she said her quote directly is in my first interview for a high school band position, the principal said, I wouldn't want my daughter teaching in a place like this. Wow. Because it was a rough school. That was my indication that he wasn't going to hire me. Yeah. The school had been open since 1922. My interview was in 1988 and that school, my school just hired their first female band director in 2017. That was you. Which is me. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's a ton more research, there's a ton more quotes, but wow. I want to leave you with, like, uh, suggestions for band directors because we're all about improving. Sure. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, we still got some more time if you want to dive into more of that stuff. I'm in. Like, <laughs> that was... I like that. Um, You know what? I want to talk about... Whatever you want. Professional interactions. Oh, this... This is good stuff. Y'all want to talk about Charge Tiffany? <laughs> go out to a brewery and she would go, let me tell you something. <laughs> Every time she did an interview. <laughs> okay. So, um, there's so much. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's socials. All right. So, um, talking about social roles within like men and women and how we interact professionally and in the world and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like you... I'm not going to go into the, like the controversy of like nurture versus nature and how men are raised versus women raised and like that kind of stuff. That's crazy. Sure. But social roles do have a lot to do with how we interact professionally. So some of the participants in my study said, I like at a conference, I can imagine myself not going up and talking to people. Even going up and talking to my interning teacher was almost terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like having to rally yourself and like mentally prepare yourself and that kind of stuff. This person said, when there's a guest conductor and everyone's going up and shaking their hand, I always feel awkward. Like, who am I to even go up and talk to them? So I always hesitate. And this is something I've definitely experienced with it, me and Andrew. But here's the thing is the, the oh yeah. But <laughs> she, ma she makes me do it. Um, but, like, <laughs> um, but the question is, and I, I could like, you say that quote and me being a man, the first thing I, I always, and one of the things we, you and I always like to talk about this because I always provide the counters to which you can just destroy me. Um, but like the <laughs> counter is just like a lot of men may, may, or people may attribute that to like, well, that's just your own personality and anxiety, but it's like the personality and the it comes from somewhere. Yeah. And that comes so, from a lifetime of X. So girls are conditioned to not 
seek out those interactions. That's that's right. Um, so for me, I'm extremely extroverted. I'll talk to anybody. Yeah, it's obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, uh, in these professional situations, I just won't speak up because I'm like, well, I'm just a band. I'm just a band director at a Title One school in in central Palm Beach County. And that's like, the conditioning of, of how you grew up. Yeah. But meanwhile, Andrew teaches a couple blocks away and he's like, Hey, my name's Andrew Lopez. Nice blimey, to meet you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this one too also spoke to me um, where if I'm at a session at FMEA or something and I have a question, I just avoid it and I don't ask my question. Yep. I should get up there and have the courage to make it happen, but I just don't. That's wild. And so this is something that happened in all of my participants. They were all saying stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And the older the older women who've been around the block a couple times, they of course were like, "Listen, I used to be like that and now I have the I have like a collegiality within the field, so I feel supported and I can ask my questions and I can do this stuff." But, and it's also at that point, you know your stuff, so like, fuck it, right? Yeah. You know? But they also they also acknowledge that like, "Hey, when I was younger, I felt that way." Right. Absolutely. Um so one of my favorite findings of this was the the existence of the good old boys club. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I love it. Oh, let's do it. So, how about this one? This is specifically about FBA summer convention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At the summer convention, they used to have this golf outing. We love you, FBA. Like, it's, we're, but this, let, let's do this. To me, it just reeked of good old boys. They never said that women weren't allowed, but it's just another part of the story. I feel like there's a lot that can be done to change this. People need to be made more aware um, that we do get treated differently and that there is a difference. And then this one is, there's an old boys club in our district. It's made up of old white men who think they run the world. Oof. They gather together in impenetrable circles and muscle their opinions over others in debates. These are things people have said about the club. We love you, old white men, we promise. And that's, and that's, and that, and for me, this is, it's just another thing. It's like, um, and this is a charged topic, but it's the idea of just because you get called out doesn't mean you're antagonized. No, they're yeah. not, they're not the same thing. And just because we point out that it's there doesn't mean that we like hate you for it. And yeah. just be, and if you identify with that demographic, we don't like. It's not a bad thing. It's just about having the conversation. No, listen, honestly, like, and I like to use the term "called in" instead of "called out," um, because what we're trying to do is be inclusive. We're trying to say, like, listen, ah. if you are part of this problematic demographic, be the reason why we start to change our minds. So, like, for me, I have some phenomenal white male band directors who have changed my life. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Have been great mentors for me, been super supportive. Like even today will answer a text message and send me some music over the next day. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm not I'm not hating on all white men. I'm just saying that the track record is that white men are the and like older white men are the dominating force in our field. Yeah. And that it's time to back off a little bit and let other people have some voices. Not and that's in, in that's not saying we don't like you there or that and that's not and it's it's one of those things where it's like just be it's <laughs> i'm trying to get the words out it's not even that it's about bringing out other people for the sake of it it's just it's okay to question and it's okay to grow and it's okay to change yeah um for the sake of it that is okay but i think i think the thing is is like if you find yourself in a situation, and like me too, and Andrew too, if we find ourselves in a situation where we know what's going on definitively, where you you are the confident person, then it's often enlightening to listen to the least confident person in the room. Because they're sitting there quietly, watching everything, learning everything, observing everything, and they I guarantee they have feedback for us. Um, so like this one, there's an older generation in our district and it's clear they don't respect everyone the same. And that the people who are younger don't voice their opinions in meetings because they're afraid they'll be shot down. Wow. And the people who are younger, a lot of the times, are women because yeah. we're new on the scene. That's new on the field. Yeah, it's women in the brown men. How about this one? What's up, everybody? The women and younger directors are the small fish, and they're the big sharks. And we are just swimming by just to exercise their power. And oh, they're just swimming by to exercise their power and keep you in your place. Wow. And the and thing is... In, you got people gotta understand these quotes don't come from anywhere. These quotes have either come from the impression that's given or they've come from actual experiences where those people who have said those things to these women may not even, it, it most likely didn't even register. It wasn't even hostile, but it didn't register. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's subliminal messages. It's being pushed out of circles. It's like when you, like if you think about it, if you walk into your FBA meeting at your district and you're gathering in a group of people, look around the group of people that you're standing with. Do they all look like you? Yeah. 
Are they all the same age as you? Do they all teach at the same type of school as you? Because like what happens sometimes in districts is you're going to see a group of black male band directors, a group of white male band directors, a group of young band directors. That's and us. They, and they don't <laughs> interact with each other. So right. it's really important to reach out and cross those boundaries and try to re- learn from other people. Yeah, and the thing is, and it's it's funny because I've met a lot of band, older band directors in in our area, not just our district, but our area, who will say it's important to reach out and breach those lines. And, but, and those are also the people that, God bless them, they do that. Yep. It, that's, and, and those are the kind of band directors that we, in general, need to um, connect with more and find mm-hmm. more and promote more. And some of those band directors, a lot of times, are usually the quiet ones, too. Yep. Like, they, 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 have, they have no problem reaching out, just no one ever does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so I have, I have two, two more great quotes for you. Go for it. Um, everyone tries to push this illusion of fairness, but in reality, nothing can truly be fair. The old men have been there the longest and they have the biggest voice. You find yourself sitting there quietly while the big dogs duke it out in meetings and you have to deal with whatever they decide is best for everyone, even when it's not. That's not in counting the votes, obviously, but like, damn. Like, I, this stuff is heavy and doing these interviews with these women was heavy. And you know what? Even when it comes down to a vote, people like the, the big dogs and the big voices will sway others. I mean, but it's that, but it's also, if you're looking at the numbers, if your district is 20% women, yeah. like, that are your best right. interests being represented? And that, that, that just, that, that perspective just won't get heard. Yeah. It'll get heard in a vote and they'll probably all vote a certain way, maybe, mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter. Uh, how about this one? I think it's that people don't think that they're discriminating, but there it is. it's just indoctrinated into people. It's not, oh, you're a girl, you can't do this. It's something that is in the back of people's heads that they don't even know that they're thinking about. Yep. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, and then we have things like, um, our district is changing a lot. It's getting younger. It's getting more female, but I still feel like I'm not part of the club. No one would ever say, don't talk to us because you're a female, but it feels very clicky. The value, um, they value some opinions more than others. Some people are free to say whatever they want and talk as much as they want, and some people are not welcome at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's even it's even things like isolation and fear and being able to be supportive. I will say on um, like if you're if you're a female band director listening right now, um, there's a lot of resources for you. Um, and I'm sure we'll include links in the podcast notes and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, one of the big resources, if you are a female band director in the state of Florida, you need to go on Facebook and join the Florida um, Florida Female Band Directors Network, I think is what it's called. I'll, it'll be linked. Um, sure. But uh, Monica Limer actually started that, and like I, I tried to help her out when we did FMEA. We did like a women's lunch um, and tried that. to meet up with everybody. It was awesome and just like a really great opportunity to network and collaborate and pick everybody's brains and get some phone numbers and just kind of like when you feel like you're isolated all the time in your own little bubble in your district or in your school, it's good to know that there's actually like a whole network of us out there that will support you. Right. Um, so recommendations for band directors. Here we go. Here's five things that we you love, can do. We love our takeaways. <laughs> five things that you can do to support girls in your band room. Cause the goal is not to make everyone a band director. That's not what we do. Nope. We're trying to create lifelong music learn lovers and you know, people who want to keep playing forever. But if you have girls who do want to go into music ed, here's how you support them. Number one, you need to actually identify your own gender biases and bring gender to the forefront in your room. Like when kids, and this goes into a whole bunch of stuff about like language that we use and things like that. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, in this in this 21st century day and age, um, trying to move away from gendered words like, all right, guys, or um, okay, we're going to have the girls play this section, the boys play this section. Don't do that. Um, just split them into group yeah. A and B. Uh, um, yeah, of course. Like I, you, you would think that that's crazy, but I was literally sitting in a professional ensemble a couple months or before COVID. So like a year ago now. Mm -hmm. And the director goes, all right, trombones, gentlemen, play it first. Yeah. And then me and Andrew's wife (laughs) were the only girls in the trombone section. And he goes, okay, girls play it. And he called them gentlemen and called us girls when we are full grown women band directors. And And I was like, this point, this point is aside. The two best people in that section were both the ladies. Yeah. And his (laughs) whole, the the whole reason why he had us do that was to show the, the guys that we were playing it right and they were not. So like he was using us as a positive example, but but the way that he did it was not well. Yeah. It's still charged. Like he could have said, okay, trombones play this together. Marissa and Tiffany, can you play it? Or band directors in the trombone section, can you play this for us? And just, and use it as a model and not as a non-example in the opposite way. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so actually acknowledge your gender biases and, and evaluate the way that you talk about gender in your classroom. 
um, nominate girls for honor bands and encourage them to do it. Don't just let them say, oh no, I'm not interested or mm, I don't have a ride or whatever. Force them to do it even though they think they're not ready mm -hmm. because girls are gonna self doubt more than your boys are. This is true. Um, the third one is educate all stakeholders on the implications of gender stereotyping of instruments. So parents, community members, principals, like literally everyone. That's one of the favorite things I, I told you. I, I've, I've told this to Christian. I've mentioned this on the podcast before. Like I refer to my tuba as my tuba ladies and my tuba queens. Mm -hmm. And there are no tuba kings. <clears throat> like you, It's only tuba queens. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. But like their parents need to know that it's okay for a girl to play a larger instrument. That's right. Um, and a lot of the times for me specifically in a Title I environment, the parents are not going to be okay with that. So you have to educate them, show them examples, find some pop culture examples of girls playing those instruments yep. and kind of break down the norms. Yep. Um, then implement blind auditions for jazz bands. There it is. Um, so when you're auditioning for your jazz band, if you're auditioning for your jazz band, I honestly encourage you to just take as many kids into your jazz band as you possibly can. Yep. Um, even just, if you need just to say split if, into two. If they ask, just say yes. Yeah. It's, it's okay. If they're interested in playing jazz, let them do it. It's your job. Um, <laughs> because the reason why is by doing an audition based ensemble, you're going to exclude the kids who, who already doubt themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to have an audition based ensemble, but if you're going to do it, do it blind. Yeah. Um, and blind audition for everything, honestly. Yeah. And like, we should, we should honestly be doing that for everything. Like all of our auditions should be blind auditions because the way that a kid walks into the room impacts the way that we evaluate them in our auditions. So like the way we're doing all state auditions is good because they can't see the kid. That's right. You just get the audio, but mm -hmm. we should be doing that in our all county auditions. We should be doing that when we audition good, for our wind ensembles. That's a good idea. <laughs> Hell, let's, you and I can implement that in our, in our county when yes. we do this for a couple of years. Absolutely. Cause she and I are the, the all county chairs for, for district 14. <laughs> um, but also encourage and mentor girls in leadership positions. So, like my drum major last year, Maria was the sweetest kid. I love him. Like, Merci. <laughs> best, love best behaved Maria. kid. Yeah. Like oldest of six siblings. Like takes care of her whole family. Just absolute rock star of a child. Got a full ride to University of Florida. I like, didn't know that. Absolutely killed it. Yeah. Um. So brilliantly smart. Number three in the senior class. Wow. Like crazy kid. Didn't think she was good enough to be drum major. <laughs> She was the only choice. Yeah, like I literally, she of course was only the only choice and like all my kids loved her, but like yeah. she doubted herself so deeply that she thought she couldn't do it. That's insane. So I you had know, to. At tracks, but it's still wild to think about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for reference, she's, she's in a Latino household. Like she's growing up being a nurturer, a caregiver, and not a leader. That's right. So being able to show her that she's capable of doing both was really cool. Okay. Um, I have three recommendations for professional organizations. Go for it. Number one. Professional development for existing members needs to include gender-based uh, professional development. And FMEA does a good job of this because they, I mean, they let me present all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's, there's, there's, that's your thing. there's been other gender based presentations also, which has been fantastic. Yes. But when I present to FMEA, they always put me on the top floor in the back room of yep. the convention center. Yo, you had a smaller room than I did. Yeah. So I have the smallest room and like a couple of years ago, I presented, some of you will probably remember it, where before I even started, the room was totally full. There's people sitting on the floor. There's people sitting in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Um, because people want to know about this stuff yeah. and we had great conversations, but they also scheduled me at the same time as like a really popular sight reading activity, whatever. Yeah. So you had to choose one or the other. And I know that's what conferences are. That's FMEA. But we, lo we love FMEA. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is like, we have to look at the way that we're scheduling things. Yeah. Um, and look at the turnout for them too. So, um, second is in your districts, when you're doing mentoring programs, emphasize same gender mentors. Okay. Because what's happening is you're getting a, a young female band director who comes in, who's trying to navigate her personal life, her professional life, doesn't know anything about band directing at all, and then gets put with like a 30 year veteran white male band director. Yeah. Which doesn't help because what they're going to say is come to me when you have questions. But what they don't understand is that young female band director is not going to ask you questions. That's right. Because she doesn't want to look like she's stupid because she has to prove herself. And yep. because on top of that, she's terrified of you. Yeah. <laughs> so having a female band director who's going to go, no, I know you have questions and you're going to like harass each other. Um, sure. And ho well, hopefully that, that mentor has that personality to tug it out of them. Yeah. You know? um, but what happens is a lot of the times as a young, as an older female teacher, you can relate to where the younger teacher has been and know what that feels like to sure. feel weird about asking questions and stuff. Whereas if you have a younger male mentee, they're just going to be like, Hey, I don't know this. Please help me. Right. <laughs> and then the last That's one, me. the last one is in your districts, 
please, 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 for the love of God, nominate and hire female adjudicators and clinicians, and not just for things you think they want to do. Yes. Hire them for everything. That's right. Nominate female clinicians for everything. That's right. Anytime you have a chance. And bring them into your room, too. Mm -hmm. Cool. I love it. Any, um... Yeah, this has been exact. This episode is exactly what I thought it was, which is absolutely <laughs> awesome. Um, do you have any other any final thoughts? Any any final words? Um, just feel free to reach out to me. Um, we'll include all my information and stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm super big into networking. I'm happy to mentor, answer any questions. Like, it's all good. I'm I'm done with my dissertation now, so I got lots of time. Yeah, <laughs> <You're just hanging. laughs> I mean, still teaching high school band, so. That Not that much time. <laughs> but you've got Whatever know. lots of time means. <laughs> you, you don't even sleep. No, no, never. All right, well, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for coming out, Tiffany. We'll bring you back on for like lots of stuff. Like we've got um we've got a couple things planned, which you're gonna be perfect to bring in in, in, in with a panel. But uh, this has been the Florida Band Podcast. We will catch you guys all later. Peace out. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Florida Band Podcast. Follow us on YouTube and contact us at flbandpodcast at gmail.com. Catch you next time.